What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So before I get into this insane, confusing, twisted, bizarre case that this entirely long video is going to be about, I need to let you guys know about a couple of things. Next week I will be attending CrimeCon and with how busy I've been and some things going on in my life, it's just not in the cards for me to post a video next Saturday. So we will be missing a video, which I am super bummed about, but I'm also excited because instead, next Thursday I'm going to be streaming a live podcast recording on my channel. So for those of you that don't know, John Lorden and myself are kind of helping along with the PI experience for CrimeCon this year alongside Sheila Waisaki, who is a private investigator. We've basically been doing cliff notes for everyone that's going to the PI experience and on the actual day that the experience is happening, there's going to be different exhibits, recreations of the crime scene, all sorts of crazy things. But John and I are doing like a full on live podcast after the event where we are going to recap the entire case and we're also going to speak to different people that went through the PI experience to get their thoughts, their theories. It's basically going to be a giant in-depth discussion on the particular case we've been looking into and we decided to go ahead and stream it to my channel to get as many eyes as possible on this case. I'm not exactly sure when the podcast is going to start. It's going to be later at night on Thursday. I will leave it up for you to watch from start to finish um, but I just wanted to to let you guys be aware of that. So if you're interested, you can definitely tune into that. It should be pretty awesome. So now jumping right on into today's case. Man, do I have a lot to say before I even get into this. So it's almost my two year anniversary covering true crime on YouTube, which is absolutely insane to think about. But one of the first cases that I think of when I think of starting my channel was Rebecca Corium and her disappearance off of a cruise ship and how bizarre it was and how controversial it was. And I kind of wanted to do something along those lines again since I'm at my two year mark here. And I have known about this case for a while and it's honestly intimidated me quite a bit. It is very scary because there is a lot of controversy surrounding it. It's mainly he said, she said, and honestly, it's heartbreaking and it's an absolute mess. It is one of the most sensationalized cases that I've probably ever covered on my channel. I just want to let you guys know that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Could I have some of this in misinformation? More than likely, a lot of this, as I stated before, is he said, she said. It's a bunch of stories from a ton of different people. They could be, they could be lying, they might not be, you know, it's just very confusing. So take everything that I say with an absolute grain of salt, do your own research. I am not going to be touching on every single theory and every single twist and turn in this case just because there are so many and what I'm giving you already today is going to have your head spinning. This is definitely one that you guys can look into on your own and really take a deep dive on it. I could honestly create probably three to four separate videos just on this one case, but I'm going to be giving you guys the absolute basics, what exactly happened, everybody's story surrounding what happened and what authorities have done. Um, there's a whole lot of drama in this case, um, a lot of anger, a lot of controversy, and a lot of those things I am just leaving out because I feel like it's completely taken away the focus from George, who is the man that I'm going to be speaking on today. So now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the disappearance slash murder slash accidental death of George Smith. So George Smith was 26 years old when he vanished and was presumed dead from the Royal Caribbean Brilliance of the Seas on July 5th, 2005. George was an absolutely awesome man. He was always very social, very, very well liked. He was in a lot of sports when he was a child. He was known for his sense of humor. He was a ladies man. He was always very clean cut. He was very attractive and he had a great setup in life. He just had a really good upbringing, a family that loved him. And he was actually set to inherit his dad's liquor store in Greenwich, Connecticut, where he grew up. So everything was going great for him in life. And it even got better when he ended up meeting a woman named Jennifer Hagel, who was a beautiful young woman, also set up for success. She was going to be a teacher. And they 
fell head over heels for each other and everybody that knew them could see how in love they were. They meshed perfectly. She had a very, very colorful personality and he did as well. So they really just vibed so well with each other. So it really wasn't that much of a surprise and made everyone so overjoyed when three years after they started dating, they ended up getting married. They got married in Newport, New Hampshire, and it was a fairy tale wedding. It was a wedding that a lot of people only dream of, but unfortunately, they did not get the happy ending that they thought they were going to. While the wedding was great, they were both so incredibly excited about their honeymoon. They were going on a pretty long cruise over in Europe, and they were really excited about it. So in late June of 2005, they set off to Barcelona to hop on Royal Caribbean's brilliance of the seas for this honeymoon. And from the start, it was the most fun that they had ever had. They quickly made friends with another honeymooning couple named Paul and Galena, and they started off their trip. They went to many different stops in the seven days that they were there before whatever happened to George happened, and they were having a great time. They took pictures everywhere they went. It was very clear to everyone around them. It was just honeymoon bliss. There were no issues going on. And then when they got back on the ship at night after all their adventures, they pretty much did the same exact thing. They went to the casino. They went out and had a few drinks. They hung out with Paul and Galena. They also had made a handful of other friends in the ship. If you've never been on a cruise before, it's a very interesting atmosphere because even though the cruise is huge and there's you know a couple thousand people on board you know you tend to meet up with the same people you tend to run into the same people whether it's people on your hallway or whether you go to the same nightclub or event every single night you quickly become friends with people on the night of July 5th around midnight it was absolutely no different they had had a great day so Jennifer and George headed down to the casino that they had been frequenting pretty much every single night since they got there. And majority of their ship friends, as I'll call them, were there with them. Now they bounced around from different tables. I think that Jennifer was learning how to play craps and George really liked blackjack. Uh, they hung out around most of the people that they had met the entire night. Pretty much everyone in the casino knew everyone at this point because they had been on the cruise for seven days at this point. And by the end of the night, it was said that both Jennifer and George were heavily intoxicated. Now, they were not ever the kind to go to bars, at least that is what Jennifer has stated. George didn't ever handle his alcohol very well. It's actually one of the first things that Paul and Galena said they noticed about him. He could have maybe three or four beers and pretty much be drunk off of them. So they just weren't the kind of people to regularly intake alcohol. Being on their honeymoon and on a cruise, they definitely did partake in a bit of drinking. But this night in particular, Paul and Galena claimed that George in particular was a lot more drunk than he had been any other night to the point where they actually tried to convince him to leave the casino and go ahead and call it a night. They were worried about his safety. You know, he was getting to the point where they felt if he got any more intoxicated, he wouldn't make it to his room. Um, it was just not a really safe situation. But even with these very basic early on details in this case, there's a lot of contradictory statements from witnesses. Despite the fact that it has been said over and over again that Jennifer and George were both heavily intoxicated, there was a couple there that had spoken to Jennifer quite a lot. They were an older couple, they had kids of their own, and Jennifer came up to them around 2.30 in the morning on July 5th and was speaking to them. This was right around the time when the casino was closing. And this couple said that she was not drunk at all. She didn't appear to even be tipsy. She was speaking fine. She was standing fine, making very coherent sentences. She was talking about how she couldn't wait to have kids in 20 years that she could take on a cruise to, with her husband. But it's a very conflicting situation from the get-go on whether or not both Jennifer and George were drunk. And it just kind of gets more confusing from here. Either way, the party went on and nothing seemed to be miss until hours later at around 7 30 in the morning. That morning the ship was at the port of Kusadasi, Turkey and a 16 year old girl named Emily Rausch saw something that she was not expecting to see. They had just gotten to the port and she had woken up early. She wanted to take pictures of you know how beautiful everything was and she came out onto her back deck, looked down and saw a massive 
blood stain on the canopy that covered the lifeboats. She took a picture of this and started to panic because she knew even at the age of 16 that this much blood likely meant someone had died in that spot and it shouldn't have been there to begin with. So she decided to go ahead and call authorities. I'm sure her parents helped her. And this is when the ship went into kind of a lockdown mode. The ship went into account for all of the guests in the ship and they were able to very easily narrow down their focus because of where exactly the blood stain was located. They kind of went up the different rooms right above this blood stain. But not just that, they were able to mainly focus on the Smith's room because there had actually been a phone call from one of the Smith's neighbors early in the morning about a noise complaint. So when they went to the Smith's room to check it out, they opened up the door and there was nobody in there. They went ahead and took pictures of the entire room and then moved on to try and locate Jennifer and George. A little while later, they were actually able to find Jennifer and she was at a spa. She had a pre-planned appointment, something that had already been scheduled for her and George to get a couple's massage, but George wasn't there and she was just enjoying this massage on her own. Obviously, authorities took her out of the spa and took her to guest relations and started asking her where on earth her new husband was. At first, Jennifer was very confused because she said that she honestly didn't remember anything at all from the night before. She said she remembered leaving the casino and then everything after that was just a blur until she woke up earlier that morning. I think she woke up sometime around eight in the morning and she immediately headed off to the appointment to get her massage. She said that George was not in the room when she woke up, but she wasn't too concerned because she assumed he had maybe fallen asleep in Paul and Galena's room or one of the other friends that they had been hanging out with. It wasn't something that he had done so far on the ship, but she had no reason to believe anything at all bad had happened to him. They, you know, had a great trustworthy relationship with each other. She knew he was a responsible man, so she wasn't too worried. But as soon as she said that, they decided to bring Paul and Galena in to ask them if they knew anything, and they said that they hadn't seen George since the casino when they tried to convince him he was too drunk and needed to go back to his room. After a short investigation by the security on the ship itself, they determined that it was very, very likely that George had gone overboard, and based on the amount of blood that was found on the awning, it was very likely that he was no longer alive. Things basically went from zero to 100 pretty dang fast and hysterics began. Jennifer, who had assumed he was just out somewhere else and would meet her later on in the day, is now being told that her husband fell overboard on their honeymoon. She's frantically calling her dad, trying to get him to get in touch with George's parents. At this point, she's by herself. She doesn't have anyone that she knows other than the few people that she had made friends with on the ship. George definitely didn't end his life. He did struggle with, I think, a panic disorder and depression, but he was not suicidal. He was taking, I think, clonazepam and Zoloft. Everything was managed very, very well. So suicide was kind of thrown out really, really quickly. But now there was this giant question of if he accidentally fell off the ship or if something had happened to him. And they wanted to nail down when all of this happened. At this point, they still don't know when exactly he could have gone overboard. And they wanted to know all of the events leading up to it. So they started to question everybody. While all this is happening, and once they kind of narrowed down who they believed was missing from the ship, the ship did notify Turkish police, which was their port, and they also notified the U.S. consulate. So all authorities possible were in fact contacted pretty quickly and the Turkish authorities boarded the ship and started their investigation. They started to question all of the people that had been around Jennifer and George most of the time on the ship, but mainly those that had been with them just the night before. And this included an American college student named Josh and it also included three Russian Americans, cousins Zach and Greg Rosenberg and Rusty Kaufman, who was their friend. So there's the three Russian Americans that were hanging out with George and then this American college student. They were all brought down to the lobby of the ship and this is when things started getting a little bit odd and their statements and their reactions to all this information have caused chaos since the day that this happened. 
So the four young men said that they had been at the casino and George and Jennifer were there. And they didn't necessarily go with George and Jennifer. Again, one of those situations where they all typically went down there and then they mingled amongst each other while they were there at night. According to them at 2.30 a.m., the casino was closing. So George and the four of them decided to go ahead and get on the elevator and head up to the disco that remained open for another hour. So the disco would close at 3.30 a.m. Josh ended up stating while talking about going from the casino to the disco that he noticed something weird happened. The casino manager's name was Lloyd and according to Josh, randomly Lloyd walked over to Jennifer and put his arm around her. Now this kind of immediately threw Jennifer's character into question and started a whole bunch of stories that Jennifer was flirting with a bunch of other men while on the cruise. But again, this is one of those things where we can't really confirm or deny what she was doing. This is just kind of what Josh was saying. And it also was putting accusations against one of the employees on the ship. They headed up to the disco and they kept partying and they actually had snuck in absinthe. So they all were taking straight shots of absinthe while up at the disco. Now, according to Rusty Kaufman, the friend of the two cousins. At some point while at the disco, Jennifer and George got into an argument. He couldn't tell exactly what they were arguing over, but Jennifer got incredibly angry and ended up kicking George in the groin and then turned around and left. Rusty was apparently the only one to see the actual argument, but the rest of the guys watched Jennifer leave the disco and they all claimed again that Lloyd, this casino manager, came up to the disco, had been there, and when Jennifer left, he followed out behind her. So they were basically telling authorities that Jennifer had been flirting with him down at the casino. He was, you know, putting his arm around her. They both ended up at the disco. She got in a fight with her husband and then she left with another man. But they said they didn't know which way that they went. Um, and that's pretty much it. So at 3.30, the disco was closing up. And by this point, George was so intoxicated, he was just slumped over a chair and... All four of the men knew that there was absolutely no way he was going to make it back to his room, so they decided to help him back all together. So they all helped him up and took him to the ninth floor to his room. Now, according to the ship's log, George's key card was in fact used to get into the room at 3.52 a.m. So this matches up. When they entered the room, they said that they all realized Jennifer was not there and this made George panic. He said that he had to go out and find her. He needed to look for her. There was no reason for her not to be there. And all four of the men, Josh, Rusty, Zach, Greg, they all said they got into a debate on whether it was a good idea to go out and look for Jennifer or not. Eventually, they agreed to go out and search for Jennifer, but for some reason, they only went to check the ship's solarium and then brought George back to his room. And this is confirmed, at least it's confirmed they got back to the room by 4.01. Now, I have a lot of issues with this particular set of circumstances. Um, you know, if they got George, this incredibly drunk person, back to his room at 3.52, had a debate over whether it was smart or not to leave, I find it hard to believe, first of all, that they would agree to go and search for Jennifer, but then for some reason only search the solarium. And then on top of that, they made it back to the room in less than 10 minutes. And this is with a debate and with leading a drunk person across a ship and back. Something about that time frame doesn't seem very realistic to me. Anyways, when they got back at 4.01 in the morning, they put George in bed, took his shoes off. They said he was super thankful. Um, you know, I know drunk people can act a little bit off and strange, but I find it weird that one moment he's panicking about finding Jennifer and then the next he's, you know, thanking them for putting him in bed and she's still not there. Uh, but either way, they left him in his room. I think Josh might have used the restroom before they left 
And then they all went back to the Russian Americans room to apparently have a room service party. They claimed that they ordered a ton of food, like a ridiculous amount of food, and they hung out. They even specifically said some of the food that they got. I think Greg's, Greg said in particular, they got like tuna sandwiches and burgers and a ton of like greasy fast food type of stuff. So that was technically their alibi that they were using for when George was thought to have went overboard. And basically, he was sitting with us, and then, then they got up and they went to the bar. And then they were sitting with other people at the bar, and then they were sitting at the bar talking over there, and he came back, he was stumbling around, so he came back to sit with us and talk. And she disappeared, and then he's stumbling around, you know, he's dead in the chair, and he's barely leaving. So we helped him back to his room, and when we got to the room, she wasn't there. We tried to find her, we brought him back, and he passed it out in the back. Then you, then you go to the room, then you greet him. Like, her. did you see her? No, no she, she wasn't in the room. She wasn't in the room. We went, um, we went back and looked for her, with him. With him. And then we couldn't find her, she was gone. And then we and came then back, to, back to George's room. And put him in bed and he went to sleep. No, we never saw him. That was the last time we were all. Yeah, after, after we dropped him off the second so time, the second, closed, we closed the door, we never saw him. Never saw him again. He said, Start, that was it. That was it. Never saw him again. We went to our room and it was just another day for us. We went to go to sleep and that's it. And that was the end of it. But I, I just remember, not at, not at one point or no time did he ever seem angry or anything at all. He was mad. He was a happy person. Nice was just, you said after the last night when you saw him, mm -hmm. they were going to but you were out. When you were in this place of the ship. Me? Yeah. Oh, I went to the room with them. Oh, and then after I left, I went to sleep. But you said you were out with your father. Yeah, look, yeah, we, we were all together. Room service, we, were, we, were we ordered room service. Uh, no, I never went nowhere. Uh, no, 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 we went we right straight to our room. Here's, 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 here's our room, and here's my room. So it's just like this. We just we thought like we thought like we did, did something, something and thought we were getting kicked out of the boat. I, that's what I thought. I put my, they put my card in the <laughs> touch. <laughs> 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 we went a lot, but I didn't even stop. No, we went a lot. Are you serious? We went a lot to go to the. Uh, go to the. No, no, go to the. Go to the. Go to the. Go to the. Go up to the 11th floor and look down. Like by the pool. So you pool level. We're not going to leave here. It's crazy. That's ridiculous. Now, the story seemed to check out at first. They were seen, you know, leaving at these particular times. I'm assuming that George appeared intoxicated on security footage. However, I've not seen the security fo footage, so I can't say that for a fact. Um, but authorities decided because of this, they were going to go ahead and move on to other possible witnesses to try to nail down even more what time George possibly went overboard. So they decided to speak to the people that made the noise complaint from the night before. The passenger that was beside the Smith's room also happened to be a deputy police chief on vacation. Now, his room was literally directly beside George Smith's room and he claimed he woke up at about 4 a.m. to what sounded like a drinking game. It wasn't anything that sounded aggressive, it was just a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of people being very, very loud. But it did quickly turn into what sounded like an argument. Now he has stated it wasn't like angry words. It just seemed like people were maybe having a disagreement. And he said it sounded like there were about three or four separate individuals in this argument, which technically matches up with the people thought to have been in the room. I think at one time there were five of them, but either way, there was an argument happening. And he said after a few minutes of arguing inside of the room, he could hear the argument move to the balcony. The argument continued on the balcony for a little bit and then one male voice continued to say, good night, good night, good night, just over and over again, almost as if they were trying to get someone out of the room. And then there was silence. But 
not really for long. After a few minutes of hearing nothing in the room, and at this point he had already called security just to have things double checked, he started hearing cabinets in the room being opened and slammed shut. And then it sounded like someone was moving furniture around the room. It was just a whole lot of loud, loud noises. It sounded like someone was looking for something. After that, there was a little bit more silence in the room and then what he described as a horrifying thud noise. That was assumed to be the sound of George's body falling over the railing and onto the awning. At some point during all of this, and I can't remember exactly when, the deputy police chief actually looked out of his door because he heard people leave the room and he saw three men going down the hallway, walking away from the Smith room. However, the issue that there is with this is that there were four men that didn't belong in the Smith room. They said four of them went to take George back. They left George in the room. Four of them should have left. So it didn't make sense that there appeared to only be three people there, maybe he missed someone, maybe someone stayed behind, maybe someone left before them. Again, we're not really sure. Security finally ended up getting to the Smith's room sometime between 4.20 and 4.30 in the morning. But at this point, they said that they didn't hear anything at all in the room. So they didn't knock on the door. They didn't check any on anyone inside. They just didn't hear anything. So they left. The neighbors on the other side of the Smith's room even corroborated the story because they heard pretty much all the exact same things as the deputy police chief. They heard the arguing, they heard the loud noises and the slamming of the cabinets, what sounded like furniture moving around, and they also heard the thud. So if these guys simply were putting George to bed, what on earth was all of the noise for? And it seemed like based on both of these witness statements, these guys were in the room a lot longer than they claimed they were. They said at 401, they put them to bed and they left. So why would they still have been there up until around 430? And there was still this question of where on earth was Jennifer during all of this? They checked to see if maybe she had actually left with Lloyd like these men were stating. Maybe this could be a motive. Maybe she was cheating on her new husband. You know, maybe he got mad. Maybe Lloyd came with her back to the room and something happened. But evidence showed that she had never left with Lloyd. He had actually left far before she did. She left the disco at 325, so just five minutes before the disco even closed and at 325 exactly was when Lloyd was actually captured coming back to his girlfriend's room. So there was absolutely no way that he had followed her out of the disco because he left at least probably 10 to 15 minutes before she did. And on top of that, there were witnesses and staff that helped her out of the disco. According to these witnesses and the staff, when she came out of the disco, she was barely even able to walk. They had to help her onto the elevator and they helped her get to the ninth floor where her room was. And then they let her get off and kind of let her go. But they watched which direction she went down and it was the opposite direction of her room, which makes sense because she actually ended up being found at 4.30 in the morning. So the same time this thud noise was heard around the same time security went and heard nothing uh, from the Smith room. She was found by a maintenance down a corridor on the opposite side of the ship on the same level as her room passed out. So it appeared as if she had in fact gone on the elevator, tried to get to her room, walked the wrong way and ended up just passing out in the middle of a hallway. So when she was found, she was so out of it that they had to put her into a wheelchair and security escorted her back to her room. And security said when they got to the Smith's room, there was nobody else in there. George wasn't in there. There didn't appear to be a sign that anything was wrong. It didn't appear as if there had just been a struggle or anything. So they just put Jennifer to bed and they left. A forensic examination was done by Turkish authorities, but after only a few hours, the room was completely cleared. The Turkish authorities said that they had gotten everything that they needed that the room could be cleaned and the ship could basically go on. While it was treated as a potential crime scene, the investigation was only done by the Turkish police only for a few hours and 
there was no chance to revisit the scene at this point, double check anything because the scene was basically opened up after only a few hours and cleaners were allowed to come in, people were allowed to come in and the ship continued on as normal. Jennifer was actually let off the boat in Turkey by herself Nobody from Royal Caribbean offered to help her get a flight home. Her husband just went overboard on this ship and they basically just dropped her off alone in a foreign country and said, here you go, like, sorry for what happened. And that's it. Her dad had to wire money over the next day in order for her to afford a flight to get home after something so incredibly traumatizing. It happened to her, the ship just left her. There were still no answers. There was no telling what the Turkish authorities were actually going to do. It was an absolute disaster. But meanwhile, back on the ship, the same men that were the last men to have seen George were just continuously getting in trouble. And that is not a very good sign. They already all had a pretty bad rap sheet since they came on the cruise. They were there with their families. Um, apparently these young men snuck in liquor to a lot of different places they weren't supposed to. They were very verbally aggressive towards all of the staff on the ship. Um, they just had already so many different complaints against them. But then two days after George went overboard, an 18 year old brought forward a pretty serious accusation. This 18 year old said that she was very intoxicated one night. I'm not sure when exactly on the, during the cruise this happened, but she said she somehow ended up back in the Russian American's room. And she says she was so drunk that she was blacking out. She was in and out of consciousness but she remembers them sexually assaulting her and they filmed it. As soon as the ship heard about this, they detained all of the men, they brought them down to the ship's lawyer and they were being held in a room and told that they were going to be kicked off the ship the second they got into Naples. This whole situation was so incredibly terrible because these men and their families were absolutely pissed. There is footage that Josh's dad actually secretly filmed of this. The lawyer, I'm assuming it is, someone that's an employee of the ship was just screaming at the top of their lungs. There were claims made that the FBI had ordered them to detain these men and apparently the FBI said they never said that. So we've got false claims going on. It was just an absolute disaster. Instructions I am under from the FBI. The boys are to remain in their room. They are to remain under supervision. They are not to leave their rooms until the FBI tells us otherwise. And when the under the X might tell the FBI to tell me that. Somebody else. The entire Askin and Rosenberg families were sequestered away in this room for two days. Frustrations ran hot. On both sides. On July 10th. The Askins and the Rosenbergs were thrown off the ship in Naples, Italy. And basically, when they reached Naples, these guys were just thrown off the ship. Their family had to get their belongings, and they were handed over to authorities for these rape allegations. But to add insult to injury, the Naples police wanted nothing to do with the rape allegations. They said it was not their jurisdiction because this happened on the open ocean, and they basically washed their hands of it. So... Nobody ever did anything about these rape allegations. This girl was brave enough to come forward with her story and authorities were basically like, eh, not our jurisdiction, sorry. That pisses me off, but it's a whole other story in itself. But the tape wasn't only filming this sexual assault. There was also interesting bits of recorded time of the men talking about George. So just hours after George went overboard, the men had gone to lunch and they decided to film their lunch conversation, which was mocking George's death. Um, they were saying some pretty terrible things. They found it funny. Rusty said something about George parachuting off of his balcony. And by the end of the conversation, Greg ended up standing up, throwing up gang signs and saying, 
I told you I was gangster. At this point, these men are looking more and more suspicious. There were four of them. The cop next door said three or four men sounded like they were arguing. Um, you know, they were known for bad behavior on the ship. They were kicked off for rape allegations. And now there is footage of them just hours later mocking the death of someone. And why would you say at the end of a conversation about someone's death, I told you I was gangster unless you somehow had something to do with it. Like you had to do something that made you prove that you were gangster. And it's just odd to be, you know, in the same conversation as someone's possible death and murder. The FBI got involved and took all of the statements and questioned all of the men in front of a grand jury. Now, nothing they were really saying was making a lot of sense. They were all still pretty much sticking to the same story. Um, their alibi ended up being checked out and it did not go through. So as I said, they claimed they dropped George off for the last time at 401 and then they went and had this room service party. First of all, that's not really a great alibi to begin with because to call in room service requires one person. So that no way proves all four of them were in the room. Second of all, the food takes a while to arrive. So someone dropping the food off and witnessing all these people in the room wouldn't have happened until probably way after George is thought to have gone overboard. So there's technically nothing at all proving all four of them were in a room by saying they all got room service. But to make matters worse, when authorities looked into the different logs, there are a few short phone calls made from the Russian American's room starting at 4.13. So just a little over 10 minutes after George was last dropped off, but they were very, very short phone calls. There is not likely enough time for them to actually place an order. And according to the log from the kitchen, no food was ever ordered from that room that night and no food was ever delivered. So these specifics about tuna sandwiches and burgers and all these things didn't sound like they were very truthful. I remember what we ate, but I don't remember who ordered it. <laughs> all right, what'd you eat? Tuna fish sandwiches, I know that. We had like tuna fish sandwiches and I think cheeseburgers. I know we had something that that fast food type we were infatuated with the fact that we could order whatever we want. Because they were young kids on it. Yeah. yeah. Who, was I, who was paying for it? My dad. My dad was paying. <laughs> my dad was heard. paying my share. I mean, I, whatever money I brought with me that was mine, that's me. My dad don't want nothing to do okay. with that. Okay. But whatever was on that card, the food is free. You know what I'm saying? That comes with the cruise. Oh, I see. Okay. Did All you guys order room service every night? Yeah, food is free. You can you order a lot of it every night? You can order whatever you want from okay. there. Food is free. Drinks are free. Right. The only thing they charge you for is Coca-Cola and stuff, man. Okay. I'm Jewish. I'm going to get juice. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. Now, at some point, so someone ordered room service, they and they did, how long did it take for the food to show up? Do you know? No. I don't remember that. Was it like 20 minutes or? Probably, that's what it takes. It's pretty quiet at night, so they probably delivered it fast. But you figure a burger and stuff, they gotta cook it, so. Yeah, tuna, I, I, th I think it was mainly just tuna fish sandwiches with Swiss cheese. And now, I have seen it stated that it was possible human error, that this food did get delivered, but maybe it just wasn't logged properly. But there's going to be more than one way to prove that a room ordered room service. First of all, they stated they ordered like half of the menu. I'm pretty sure everyone in the kitchen would remember if they made that much food at 4.30. 30 in the morning and I'm sure someone would remember dropping it off and the fact that it doesn't seem anyone has come forward I don't know I'm just saying yes it could have been human error but there are also I feel multiple other ways they could have double checked this information at this point their alibi didn't check out their stories about Lloyd were proven to be false and a ship employee also came forward saying that he had actually been in an elevator with Josh Josh was with one of his friends. It was right after everything happened with George. And this employee heard Josh say, I know a lot more than they think I know. These guys almost got me arrested in Turkey. So the pressure was really on these guys. And eventually the FBI told them that if they changed their story at all, they would all be charged with perjury because this case was very, very frustrating. You know, the crime scene was only considered a crime scene for a handful of hours. 
We don't know how well Turkish authorities investigated, what they took forensically, the results that came back. There was apparently a spot of blood on the bed. All the witnesses, you know, some of them had matching stories, but then there were some of them that completely contradicted those stories. So it, it didn't make a lot of sense. A lot of these people hadn't known each other, but for a week. So it was like so much he said, she said speculation that it was impossible to get anything solid at all. All four of the men's lawyers suggested that they, from then on, um, basically invoke their Fifth Amendment whenever anyone asked them questions about George. And Josh and Zach, I think, ended up being the only one to actually listen to that advice. Rusty still answered questions in his deposition, but majority of it, he basically just claimed he didn't remember. Greg was eventually found in a Florida prison for drug trafficking, and he stuck to his story as well that he did nothing wrong. So from what I've seen, all of them took polygraph tests. I'm pretty sure all of them failed, but Greg's came back as an conclusive. And Jennifer also took a polygraph and she passed and was cleared by the FBI. So basically the only questionable people left in this were these four men. Specialists ended up looking into the polygraph results and the videos from the depositions of all these men. And Greg in particular was acting very, very suspicious out of all of them. So as I said, his results came back as inconclusive. We all know you shouldn't put a lot of weight into polygraph tests, they are inaccurate. He has ADHD from what he said, so that is one surefire way to kind of mess with the results. But the specialist said that after looking at everything, there were multiple points of deception. And it wasn't even what Greg was saying, it was what he wasn't saying. You expect a very certain type of behavior from someone that's being accused of potentially murdering someone. Normally you would expect that person to say, I didn't do this, you've got the wrong person, you know, you're wrong, I'm innocent very like specific and direct statements saying, I did not do this. But Greg was more focused on explaining why he couldn't have done it. It was like he was creating as many scenarios as he could and explanations as he could that would hopefully make it impossible for him to have done it. You know, he, he said, you know, I'm not that kind of a person. I'm a really great guy. Therefore, I couldn't have done it. Or, you know, just things along those lines. It seemed like a bunch of overcompensation. And he was especially thrown by a couple of curveball questions. One in particular seemed to really bother him. He was asked if there was anything found in either their room or the Smith's room that could connect him to the crime. And you see the panic instantly in his eyes. You can see his mind is rolling over something and he stayed quiet for a good period of time and then finally said, no, no, of course not. But for a minute, he was thinking and it really looked like he was possibly thinking, crap, wait a minute, did I leave something behind? Did I miss something? It's just very odd, his behavior. But unfortunately, they just didn't have enough evidence to charge with anything. The FBI was getting absolutely nowhere with these guys. They were sticking to the same story. And eventually in 2015, the FBI closed the case and it was absolutely devastating to the family. Everyone said that they did everything they could to figure out what happened to George, but I just don't know if I agree with that. I do want to state that this is an incredibly large case and so many different people have looked into it. The families hired people to look into it. Different governments have looked into it. You know, Turkish authorities have looked into it. I think the US consulate was there. The FBI eventually came in. Things were reported to the Bahamas. It's just all over the place. You know, the blood on the awning was apparently possibly painted over. Now this is another big controversial thing. Royal Caribbean says they never painted over the blood spot. There have been multiple people that have gone on the cruise, um, like different reporters and investigators. They've rewalked things, they've looked at different areas and they all say it looks like it's been painted over. Apparently in the pictures that they first took of the room that morning when they were doing their early searches to account for everybody, there is an obvious blood stain on the bed, just two like small bits of blood. 
and you don't see that really talked about a lot. I haven't really seen much about the Turkish authorities speaking about it. The crews doesn't really talk about it much. I don't know if the FBI ever had access to the room and I think it's possible that when they finally did gain access to the room, it's after it had been cleaned and evidence had been destroyed. And to top it off, the captain of the ship reported to the Bahamas, which is where the ship is based, and immediately claimed it was an accident before an investigation had even been done. You know, they are saying that they have no obligation to report these things, but how can a captain of a ship that wasn't there, that has not heard anything about the investigation, so blatantly say it was an accident. And he, I mean, he goes into detail of what exactly happened to George as if he was there watching it himself. I'm gonna play a clip of him saying it. He states his assumptions like they are fact and that is so incredibly dangerous. So in my opinion, I think there was an idea in his head to begin with. He's the captain of the ship. You know, as long as Turkish authorities say it's fine, if he already thinks it's, you know, an accident, he has full power to just keep on going. <laughs> He was getting some fresh air, or he wanted to, to get some fresh air from the balcony. He was sitting on the, on the railing, and uh, he lost his balance, so it's easy. It's easy to fall over from if you are sitting on the railing. It's a high railing, and then you need the chair to put it then to step on the chair and to sit on the railing. So I think that still he lost his balance and he fell over. I think there's definitely more that possibly could have been done. There is a camera on the ship that directly faces the side of the ship that George would have fallen over, but I have no idea if these cameras were ever checked. I have no idea if it's even been acknowledged that they're there. There's unfortunately no cameras in any of the hallways. There's only cameras in the public areas where people congregate, so there's no telling who actually did come to and from the room that night. It's just a giant mess and I'm just really unsure if everything was done and I feel like the FBI was able to close it out because of lack of evidence because not enough was done to begin with, if that makes sense. I feel like if this had been treated a little bit differently in the beginning, maybe the FBI would have had more to go off of and that's kind of the big debate in this right now is, you know, there seems to be this evidence, there's inconsistencies in the men's stories, um, you know, there's the fact that their alibi didn't check out half their stories that they told to like put the, I guess, focus on someone else were all lies, like absolute blatant lies. So it's just a sketchy situation. There was blood found on the bed, according to those pictures again. And some people that have looked at it have claimed that it looks like a mark from where if you pinched yourself with a watch and one of the most expensive things that George always wore was a Breitling watch. So if someone had robbed him that night while he was in his room, took advantage of him being under the influence, it could have pinched him and he could have started bleeding. But according to the family and everyone, you know, we have no idea what forensic examinations were even done to this blood. The largest theory at this point is that Jennifer and George were possibly targeted they both barely drank, so what a coincidence that on the exact same night, for the first time ever since they had been together, since they had been on the cruise, they both ended up so drunk that they had to have help back to their room. And I'm talking like in and out of consciousness drunk. It's just very interesting that it happened on the same night to me. And on top of that, both George and Jennifer were very clean cut, well-dressed, nice looking people. He always wore the expensive Breitling watch that I just spoke about before. You know, they had apparently said in front of multiple different witnesses that came forward, um, they spoke about how much money they had back in their room. You know, when they were gambling and they would run out of money, he would go back and get a stack of cash, come back, they would keep going. So even these random people on the ship knew he had a nice watch, he, they appeared to be very well off, and they had heard from the Smiths themselves that they had money back in their room. So basically anyone that got remotely close to this couple could have seen this and assumed they were worth robbing. It could have been 
a robbery gone wrong. Were they maybe drugged that night? After all, a few witnesses stated that Jennifer was not drunk at 2.30 in the morning. So you're telling me she went from completely fine and coherent to passing out within an hour? It's not that that's impossible. It just seems like a bit of a stretch to me. She completely lost her memory. And even she says that by the time she left the casino, she wasn't remembering anything. That's the exact same time witnesses say she was sober. So did someone put something in her drink and it hit her real quick? It just seems like a perfect setup for disaster. I think it's very possible that both of them were drugged or at least she was drugged and his you know, lack of ability to handle alcohol was used against him. When it comes to him accidentally falling over the railing, the railing was about four feet high. That's pretty dang high. You would have had to climb up on top of a chair to sit on the railing or even get over it. Um, it was a 21 foot drop from the balcony down to the awning. And another issue I have is with the amount of blood that's on the awning. I'm sure that fall could definitely cause a good amount of damage, but I wish I knew if it was possible for that much blood to come from a fall like that. It makes me question if he was potentially bleeding and hurt before he went over, which again could indicate foul play, but unfortunately, Everyone's pretty much closed this case out. They just say there's not enough information to prove that George was murdered. You know, it just honestly really sucks. And it's been a giant argument and a bunch of drama. And this case has been so sensationalized that it makes me sick to my stomach. Unfortunately, Jennifer and her ex-in-laws do not speak anymore. They were supposed to file a lawsuit against Royal Caribbean together. I'm assuming a wrongful death lawsuit, but Jennifer, because she was the administrator of George's estate, she actually settled with Royal Caribbean behind his parents' backs which basically took away their claim. She didn't tell them that she was doing this and because of this claim, they lost use of a bunch of different witnesses, some of the evidence. Uh, they did in fact go ahead and file another claim separately, a wrongful death suit, but they lost their ability to use majority of the evidence that they needed to pretty much prove it. Uh, they also believe that Jennifer knows more than she is letting on. I have no idea from the little information that we have, most of it being, again, he said, she said information. I have no way to really form an opinion on that. When it comes to the facts, she was seen leaving at 325. She was seen getting off the elevator and going in the direction that she was later found in an hour later passed out. There is no evidence at all that supports her going back into the room. So I don't think it's possible she could have, you know, been directly there to do something to George. But that also doesn't mean she doesn't know something. Cruise ship incidents like this make me so incredibly unsettled because it is far too easy and it happens far too often that they are brushed off as accidents or suicides. That way, the cruise can continue its journey. They don't have to deal with legalities. They don't have to deal with foreign governments and authorities. They don't have to send all of the guests back home. I feel like, unfortunately, being in the middle of the ocean and jumping from jurisdiction to jurisdiction is a massive scapegoat. I think it's used way too often. I think these incidents are never looked into as deep as they should be and the boats just keep on going. You know, it's all about money, I feel like, and that's disgusting. I feel like the cruise companies want to brush it off as fast as possible so they don't lose any money, so they don't have any negative attention drawn to them. I feel like the authorities wanna brush it off quickly because it's easy for them to. They have an easy reason to say no because the boat was out in the middle of the ocean. It's just devastating because I feel like majority of families involved in incidents like this never get the answers. You know, there seems to be so much push and shove. Nobody wants to hand anything over. The cruise ship wants to do their own investigation and then wants to lock that information away. And then the foreign authorities, that's a whole other thing to deal with. It's just unfair and it's so much to go through. And I feel like there are just not enough laws and regulations around things that happen on cruise ships, who handles what. As I said, there is just a lot going on in this case. I have probably not even touched <laughs> 
a huge portion of it. Um, it's just really difficult to navigate cases like this where there is so much conflicting information and there's so much drama going on behind the scenes. Um, I really wanted to make sure I stuck to George himself and what exactly happened that night, what has been proven, what people have said happened and how authorities reacted. But if you want more of this information, if you think it'll give you a little bit better of an understanding of the case, definitely go check out a lot of the different articles that are out there. You can also check out the YouTube page, Justice for George. I am unsure who exactly runs the YouTube page, but it has a giant collection of all kinds of interviews and news clips, um, different you know portions of very important people speaking about certain events and very specific uh, bits of the evidence so you can get a lot more of an understanding of behind the scenes stuff there There was a $100,000 reward for any information that led to what exactly happened to George that night I am unsure if this reward is still being offered. I know the FBI closed the case in 2015 I don't know if that reward was through them or if it was through his family and if it was through his family I can't seem to find if they're still offering it um, If any of you guys managed to stumble on that in your own research, please do let me know so I can put that down in the description box down below. Now that is pretty much it, you guys. It is absolutely an insane case. I feel so incredibly terrible for George's family. I just feel like this has turned into one giant fight for everybody involved and it's preventing everyone from telling the full truth. And that's heartbreaking to me. They don't have anyone to bury. They don't have any closure. They have no answers. It's just infinite questions for them. If you take anything from this video, it's please be vigilant when you are on vacation. Please be vigilant while you are on a cruise. If this was foul play, it easily could have happened because they let the wrong thing slip about their money. I know it's exciting to go on vacation. I know it's exciting to be around a bunch of new people and you're having fun and you're partying, but we are way too easy to trust people in these situations. That's also why so many people are abducted while on vacation because we just let our guard down and that is so incredibly dangerous. There's no telling the kind of person that you're vacationing with that you just met three days ago. There's just no telling, so please practice safety no matter where you go and be very, very vigilant of your surroundings. Keep it locked up tight. Please all of you be safe. When I said I was talking about a cruise case this week, a lot of you said on social media that you were gonna go on a cruise soon, so learn from this. Be very careful, always protect yourself. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Honestly, the theories could go on and on. There's people that believe Jennifer orchestrated this. There's people that believe, you know, you know, these guys had everything to do with it. There's people that believe complete strangers that got off scot-free somehow had something to do with this and didn't leave a trace behind. So definitely, no, definitely let me know what you think. Also, please leave some kind words for George's family down below. I cannot even Imagine what they've had to go through ever since this happened. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch today's video. And don't forget if you haven't already to hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Hallen fam. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.